CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, attended by conservative activists and elected officials from across the United States, began with a bang recently when conservative Christians wheeled in a six-foot-tall golden idol of Donald Trump. Now it's time to play the Spanish Inquisition's favorite game show, Break That Commandment! Welcome to the show, I'm your host with the most, Alex K. Let's put the commandments up on the board and start the game. Number one, you shall have no other gods but me. Trump said that he has never asked for forgiveness from God for anything he had done. And countless witnesses have said that all he thinks about is himself and his money and wealth. Survey says... Commandment broken! Number two, you shall not make unto you any graven images. Well, I don't know about a golden calf, but that is definitely a gaudy god. Survey says... Commandment broken! Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. At a rally in North Carolina, Trump told the crowd about the Islamic State, they'll be hit so goddamn hard. Survey says... Commandment broken! Number four, you shall remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. We're sorry, Donny boy. Golf on Sunday doesn't count. Survey says... Commandment broken! Uh, number five. Honor thy father and mother. Now, I'm not really sure if claiming you are the son of a German immigrant when your father was actually born in New York counts as honoring your father, but anecdotally deporting your own dad seems close enough. Survey says... Commandment broken! Number six. You shall not murder. While there is no direct evidence that Donnie ever actually pulled the trigger on anyone, during the Trump-inspired Capitol insurrection of January 6th, five people died or were fatally injured during the event, including one Capitol Police officer. Survey says... Commandment broken! Number seven, you shall not commit adultery! Commandment broken! Number eight, you shall not steal! Oh, come on, are we even trying now? shall not bear false witness. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Commandment broken! Number 10, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Okay, this is just getting ridiculous. Survey says... Commandment broken! Him. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a new grand champion! Bridget, tell us what he's won! Thank you, Alex. We've got some great prizes for our champ. He wins a lifetime supply of rice aroni, that San Francisco treat, and a year supply of turtle wax, keeping turtles shiny since 1941. Furthermore, our grand prize winner gets an eternity, roasting in the fiery pits of hell! <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Bridget. Thank you very much. And don't forget, each member of our audience gets a copy of the Break That Commandment home game. Break That Commandment is a Planet X abstraction production. I'm Alex K, and thanks for playing. Woo! Recorded in Round Rock, Texas, in front of a live teleconferenced audience, it's the What's Update with Xander Quation. Season 2.5, staying alive, baby. Woo! Yeah! Woo! Yeah! Uh, hey, welcome to the What's Update. I'm Xander Quation. Let's get started. The NCAA recently announced that it would welcome tens of thousands of basketball fans to Indianapolis and San Antonio for this year's March Madness tournaments, in a move that will generate millions of dollars, but risks further spread of the coronavirus throughout the United States. According to Dr. John Swartzberg, a professor emeritus at the University of California, Berkeley, who has studied infectious diseases and served as an advisor for the Pac-12 conference, Bringing people from all over the country to a congregate setting is just nuts. Remember, folks, April showers might bring May flowers, but March Madness brings April sadness. <laughs> <laughs> In other sports ball news, John Gennert, a former U.S. Olympic gymnastics coach who led the women's team to the gold medal in, 20, in the 2012 Olympics, 
has died by suicide rather than go to jail. Gettert killed himself Thursday after he was charged with sexual assault against children and human trafficking, as well as lying to law enforcement to protect Larry Nasser, another child molester. We don't have a joke for this, but as a public service announcement of sorts, if you're thinking of molesting kids, think of John Gettert and kill yourself. <laughs> Federal agents in Cincinnati seized millions of dollars worth of cocaine-coated cornflakes, according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection. After opening the box, CBP officers saw cereal with white powder with flakes coated in a grayish substance, which they tested and found that the shipment had 44 pounds of cocaine-coated <laughs> cornflakes, with the street value upwards of $2.82 million. According to testing agent Anthony T. Jair, <laughs> they are great! <laughs> According to a federal government report, the average life expectancy in the United States fell by a full year. Because of COVID, the expected lifespan dropped to 77.8 years compared to 78.8 years in 2019. Of course, Nobody noticed because the last four years, especially 2020, felt like 15. <laughs> the NASA rover Perseverance has successfully landed on Mars. Perseverance is the first NASA mission to Mars in nine years. The rover is embarking on a mission searching for evidence of past life on the Red Planet. Back on Earth, Americans watched the footage with hope and subsequently looked ar around for evidence of their past lives. Unfortunately, all they found was jealousy, realizing that, unlike them, the Perseverance rover got to go outside without wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> this week, the House passed the Equality Act, which would prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. The legislation was previously passed by the House in 2019, but was blocked by Mitch McConnell's Republican-led Senate. However, the Democrats have control of the Senate and the White House this time around and the measure will pass if they can get the 60 votes to overcome any Republican filibuster. Now, I think I have an alternative solution. Shut down the Senate men's room. Like, these weirdos are so bunched up about who gets to use what restroom, so let's see how long they last. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... It was recently revealed that senior Pentagon officials held back the promotions of two female generals, but not for the reasons you might think. Mark T. Esper, the defense secretary at the time, and General Mark A. Milley, the then chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, fearing that any female generals would simply be discarded and the positions filled with more white men by the Trump administration, decided to wait until after the election believing that the two women would have a better chance in a Biden White House. They were concerned about how Trump would treat female generals, because we already have his recorded position on what he does with female privates. Oh. <laughs> Sad but true. According to a New York Times investigation, at least six of the insurrectionists who entered the Capitol during the January 6th attack had previously provided security for Trump ally and costumed criminal Roger Stone. Right. The Penguins' henchmen are storming the Capitol, the Joker got impeached twice, and I'm pretty sure Hydra infiltrated the GOP years ago. Now, while we're on the subject of cartoon villains, since being stripped of her House committee powers, QA mom, Marjorie Taylor Greene, is using her free time in Congress trying to be the Trumpiest of all Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. Not only did the Georgia representative vote against the Equality Act, but then Karenon put up an anti-transgender sign outside her office, directly across from the office of a Democratic colleague who has a transgender daughter. To paraphrase an old joke my grandmother used to tell, what do you call that useless piece of flesh surrounding an American flag pin? Mm -hmm. Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> <laughs> According to four people familiar with his condition, Donald Trump was sicker with COVID-19 in October than White House officials publicly acknowledged at the time. He had extremely depressed blood oxygen levels at one point 
and a lung problem associated with pneumonia likely caused by the coronavirus infection. Of course, who needs lungs when you don't have a heart? <laughs> now, speaking of the heartless, apparently Ted Cruz's wife was pretty upset about the coverage of her family during the recent extreme winter storm in Texas. Appearing on a podcast, old Ratface Raphael said that his wife, Heidi Cruz, especially didn't like the unflattering picture taken of her in a bikini while sunning at an exclusive Cancun resort, as millions of Texans, including her dog, Snowflake, were freezing without water and power. When asked as a character witness, even Cruella DeVille was like, Nah, fam, that ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> In our continuing coverage of Dixie Pixie, living legend, and national treasure, Miss Dolly Parton, we present our recurring segment, Dolly Watch. Yay! Earlier this year, Tennessee State Representative John Mark Wendell proposed erecting a statue of Miss Dolly that would sit on state capitol grounds. His proposal was intended to recognize Miss Parton for all she has contributed to the state. Furthermore, the sculpture would face the historic Ryman Auditorium, a music venue where she has played throughout her career. In the most dolly way possible, she graciously declined the honor, tweeting, I'm honored and humbled by their intention, but I have asked the leader of the state, of the state legislature to remove the bill from any and all consideration. She continued, given all that's going on in the world, I don't think putting me on a pedestal is appropriate at this time. This should not come as a shock to anyone that follows Miss Parton's illustrious career as a performer and humanitarian. Uh, other honors she has declined over the years include doing a Super Bowl halftime show with Katy Perry, being a judge on RuPaul's Drag Race, and getting the coronavirus vaccine that she funded the research for ahead of everyone else. She also turned down the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our country's highest civilian honor, twice when it was offered to her when, by the Trump administration. We love you, Miss Dolly. Stick around. We'll be right back. Yeah! All right. Woo! Yeah. yeah! Welcome back. So, here's the thing. The week that started with Valentine's Day was, well, to put it lightly, a fucking nightmare. Mm -hmm. Little did we know that when we shot the outro for our previous episode in the two feet of snow in my backyard, that it would be the most delightful and innocent part of a really, really messed up week. Most of the late night guys were off that week doing, I don't know, whatever it is they do when they're not on air. I'll circle back <laughs> to that later. <laughs> we spent that week here in Round Rock filled with dread and anxiety, hoping we didn't lose water and or power. F full disclosure, my family was exceptionally lucky. We didn't lose power, and only the cold tap in our kitchen froze. Uh, we managed the supplies we had on hand to last until we could safely venture out for more on day five. But there was a tense moment on day two when our cats were completely out of food. Luck was on, a, luck was on our side again when our next-door neighbors came to the rescue, because they have a nice large pickup truck. The road conditions were so bad that the normally 20-minute round trip to the store turned into a two-and-a-half-hour polar expedition. They brought us kitty food and some people food as well. Thanks again, neighbors. Woo! Doing the Lord's work. I'd like to take another couple moments to express extreme gratitude and humbled admiration. First is gratitude. Not only have people from all around the country pitched in funds and donations of necessities like food and water to the relief efforts in Texas, but the outpouring of genuine love and concern has been inspirational. Another special thank you goes to some of our loyal fans for checking in on us while all of this was going on. From former Re U.S. Representative from Texas, Beto O'Rourke, and current Representative from New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, to Chef Jose Andres of World Central Kitchen, and most of all, to HEB which is the beating heart and unrelenting soul of Texas. The relief effort has brought necessary comfort to many that were suffering. In that spirit of gratitude, we'll momentarily overlook all the malicious ghouls that rapturously delighted in the misery and anguish of the people in the Lone Star State. I'll circle back around to that one in a minute as well, Raphael. <laughs> 
Second is our most sincere admiration for the millions of Texans that did what needed to be done to get through the snowpocalypse that started on Valentine's Day, an event that we are calling the Texas Valentine's Week Massacre. <laughs> There was no way for ordinary folks to adequately prepare for such an unusual and punishing weather event and the subsequent catastrophic failure of our infrastructure. People all over our great state went for days without electricity or water in some of the harshest winter conditions experienced in nearly half a century. From the woman that rationed wood from her fence to burn to keep her family warm, to the Austin couple that sheltered their grocery delivery driver for five days when she couldn't drive back to Houston because of the storm, the stories of neighbors banding together to help neighbors is legitimately touching. <sighs> Unfortunately, even the indomitable spirit of your average Texan was no match for the undisguised contempt of our state's representatives. I haven't forgotten about you, Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> and the naked greed of the kleptocrats put in charge of our power grid and water utilities. On February the 21st, the Washington Post reported at least 32 dead in Texas storms alone. The criminal failure of our state government's stewardship of its population absolutely must result in investigations, resignations, and incarcerations. Yeah. There's, there, there's absolutely no excuse for the... Epic failures of the likes of Governor Greg Abbott and Senators John Cornyn and Ted Cancun Cruz. It's difficult to say which of them was the most negligent. Our fearless leader, Governor Abbott, blamed the failure on Texas's renewable energy systems, such as wind turbines, despite the fact that such energy sources contribute only a small fraction of the power supply to the state. When cornered with facts, he then tried to shift the blame to the Green New Deal and Democrats, in spite of the fact that no such federal legislation is even being proposed, much less enacted. Instead of fulfilling his oath of office to serve the people of Texas, he instead ran straight to Fox News to peddle lies and excuses. Mm -mm. At least Abbott was showing his feckless face. Four-term Senator John Cornyn was just nowhere to be found. And then, there is the tacky tale of Ted Weasel-Faced Sack of Farts Cruz. <laughs> Where do we start with Ted the Turd? Taking a sunny trip to Mexico while Texans froze to death? Sure, says Ted. Getting busted, then claiming he was just escorting his family, and then planned to come back the next day the whole time? Why not? Integrity is clearly not a word in Raphael's vocabulary. Hmm. Blaming his kids and, and his wife for forcing him to skip the country? Ah, uh, classic duty head Ted. <laughs> Leaving his poor poodle Snowflake in a frigid house in Houston for a week while he suns the busted can of biscuits he calls an ass on the exclusive private <laughs> beaches of the Cancun Ritz-Carlton Resort? Get Ted some sunscreen and dos margaritas muy grandes, por favor. Go extra salt and be quick about it. Uh -huh. ah. Staging a photo op to load one piddly ass box of water into a maskless woman's minivan in an empty parking lot? Super on brand. For real, Raphael, you suck. Yep. Yep. You suck so <laughs> much. <laughs> and then. There is the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, which manages the state's power grid. ERCOT officials presented its board a timeline of events leading up to the grid being only 4 minutes and 37 seconds away from a catastrophic failure that could have left all of Texas in the dark for weeks. Wow. As much as we would love to blame ERCOT or even the Public Utility Commission of Texas for the super pooch screw that was the Texas Valentine's Week Massacre, the real blame lies squarely in the lap of the very Republican and heavily gerrymandered Texas legislature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's hard to decide what is a bigger kick to the icicles. The fact that the legislature has been ignoring a PUC and ERCOT's recommendations for upgrades and winterization of power plants for nearly a decade, or that many of the same so-called public servants have profited off of the deregulation of Texas's en energy industry. I feel it was best summarized 
by Sunrise Movement's digital director and San Antonio resident, Paris Moran, when she wrote, Governor, Ab Governor Abbott has failed to protect Texans from the climate crisis, promoting a deadly fossil fuel economy, and selling us out alongside other leaders for privatization and destructive deregulation. Abbott and the Republican Party have proven that they will not govern under any circumstance, no matter how many lives are at risk. Whether it's utility blackouts, the climate crisis, or coronavirus, it's easier to find misinformation here in Texas than actual updates from our government, utility companies, and other institutions. Mm -hmm. While we're on the subject of misinformation, it should come as absolutely no shock to anyone the level of disgusting coverage, attempts to shift blame, gaslighting, and bald-faced lies spread by Fox News, One American News Network, and Newsmax. The limbotomized bottom feeder known as Tucker Carlson and his cadre of cracozoid cretins tried to pin the disaster on renewable energy, the Green New Deal, and wind farms. And the icing on the frozen cake was former governor of Texas and Trump ass kisser, Rick, the glasses don't make you look smart, you can still see your face, Perry. <laughs> Suggesting that the people of the Lone Star State would rather spend more time without electricity then see increased federal involvement in their state. Um, uh, Rick, Rick, uh, honey, come here. <laughs> we would all be much obliged if from this point forward you would refrain speaking on, on behalf of Texas, Texans, or vertebrates in general. Hmm. We despise you. Go away forever. Shoot, 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 <laughs> get out, go. <laughs> oh. This next bit is a lo siento, no siento. I feel obligated to take issue with the men of late night. Samantha B, you're still super cool with us, ma'am. Look, I get it. I make fun of the news, too. Who hasn't made a few hundred Florida man sticks bacon bazooka and gator jokes? <laughs> Stupid fish, huge barrel. All right? <laughs> but the giddy deluge of cheap shots from the dudes that come on after the nightly news definitely qualifies as the comedy sin of punching down. People literally froze to death. Already strained by the pandemic, hospitals were struggling with no power or water to keep their existing patients alive. Fire departments couldn't put out structure fires in multiple cities because there was no water to be found. Please understand that I am 100% all in for calling the dipshits in charge of that Michigash dipshits. But on Stephen Colbert's show on February 22nd, he wryly implied that the people of Texas are somehow responsible by stating, you know what they say. Those who failed to learn from history were probably educated in Texas. Cute, Colbert. Real cute. It started poorly with his dunk on Texas, smugly saying, now this might shock you, but there are states besides Texas that have to deal with the phenomenon known as winter. It's true, you can look it up. <laughs> you know what, Stevie? You got us there. Winter can be a bitch in South Carolina, where you come from, Chicago, where you went to college, New York, where you work, and New Jersey, where you live. What, wait, you, you mean there are people who a actually choose to live in New Jersey? Apparently. Weird. Uh, why? Why would you do that? Mm. Mm. Alright, oh, wait, where was I? New Jersey. Oh, that's bad. So, you know what Texas doesn't have that all the all these other places do? An infrastructure to handle extreme winter conditions. You know why we don't have that? Because we don't have extreme winters. Shit, we barely have a winter, let alone an extreme winter, that would necessitate an entire infrastructure for it. When the hell are we going to use an extreme winter plan anyway? <laughs> Unfettered mercenary capitalism had far more to do with the recent disaster in Texas than our inability to accessorize salt for the roads with our plethora of F-150s. But while we're on the subject of extreme weather, you and the rest of the New York and LA late night guys would melt into little puddles of smug goo if you had to deal with one of our weeks in August where it is 110 degrees in the shade with 80% humidity. I mean, come on! Most Isley is north of here! <laughs> so, if, if you would 
be so kind. Please, don't paint all Texans with the same brush used to animate low-life shit heels like Greg Abbott, John Corden, and Cubo-Canadian cuckold Ted, you chinless <laughs> bastard, Cruz. <laughs> You guys, you guys are better than that. It's why, when you got back to work, y'all jumped in and promoted links to charities, helping Texans get back on their feet. It's why people look to you for information and to laugh when the world goes sideways. It's why I want to do what you do when I grow up. Lucky for you, I'm not growing up anytime soon. But I will. Someday. And on that faithful day... <laughs> I'm coming for your jobs, you old farts. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, ultimately, my point is this. Texas is often the target of many a lazy joke and a lot of surreptitious envy. We get it. We really do. We are larger, faster, prettier, and more cunning than the rest of y'all. And you're certain that if the shit went down, we would all probably eat you with beans and barbecue sauce. Yep. <laughs> Wait, that's Wile E. Coyote. <laughs> the real thing is that Texas suffered a pretty serious and unexpected blow. There is legitimate blame to go around. I hope that my fellow Texans will use this frozen wake-up call to insist on making real systemic changes so we don't find ourselves at the mercy of unexpected weather and unscrupulous capitalists ever again. Texas is strong. Texas is proud. Texas is forever. We'll be right back. Yeah! yeah. Welcome back. Our guest is another special treat for me, so we'll start with our standard questions. Who are you, what's do, and why? Uh, I am Mike Drucker. Uh, I am a comedian who is also the co-head writer and co-executive producer of Full Frontal with Samantha Bee, and I also do video game writing. And why I do those things is uh, because it's a nice way to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> Could you ever imagine yourself doing anything else? Um, I, I worked at Nintendo for a while doing a somewhat similar oh. job to this, and I could imagine doing that forever. But outside of like video games or TV, I'm not sure what I, I would probably be like an English teacher or an IT guy in South Florida. Wait, so for a while, were you ever the subject of, well, my uncle works at Nintendo, and they're going to they're gonna get you kicked off of the e shop. I, I, I was, but I was never that close with my family, so it was always like, <laughs> no. it, 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 it was never my uncle. I don't have any, like, nieces or nephews, but I definitely had cousins that are like, you know, he works at Nintendo, and I'd be like, yeah, I can send you a shirt, I guess. Like, I, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you any secrets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, right, so let's get back on track. Is sure. there anything you have uh, coming out soon or anything you're doing soon that you want to tell our audience about? Sure. Um, uh, speaking of video games, I wrote an entire book on one video game called Silent Hill 2. It is part of a series of books called Boss Fight Books. Uh, people oh. watching are probably more familiar with the 33 and a third books about individual music albums. This is the same thing, but for video games, and I wrote one. All right. So these books are like talking about uh, video, the video games as a whole or like, like the history of it, sort of an analysis of it, why it works, how it works. Um, each author takes a different tack. Like mine is much more history and analysis of it. And some people do like a full book that's just their personal experience around it or how like one guy wrote a book about a Japanese game and how it helped him acclimate to J Japan. But mine's a little more English majory. <laughs> hmm. So I'm guessing you're able to dissect all the hidden meanings of the things that are coming out of the darkness trying to kill you. It's like yep. that too. It is the first time I've used my master's in lit, and I am happy that I finally got to use that $40,000 albatross <laughs> around my neck. <laughs> It'd probably also be a, a freaking playground for a, a psychology major as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So aside from uh, being writers, performers, and wicked good looking, uh, we also have both done The Dork Forest with uh, Jackie Cation. Yeah! You, you did yours on horror games. I did, yeah. So, so what is it about horror games that uh, overall that you find appealing? Um, I think that, you, I mean, I like horror movies, but what really drives me about horror games is is the interactivity of them, which sounds obvious, but, you know, in a horror movie, 
it's out of your control. And there's a scariness to that of don't go in there. Oh, no, they're going in there. But with horror games, it is within your control. So there, instead of it saying don't go in there, it's this feeling of, oh, no, I have to go in there. Ooh, and yeah. to me, that's a much more compelling feeling uh, of that like sense of like, you know, I don't want to do this thing that I know I have to do in the game. So I can either stop playing or do this thing I don't want to do. And horror games are great for that. And I just feel like th when they're immersive and when they're good, they're some of like the most real emotional experiences you can get in games. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, for a movie like, uh, let's say the Saw series, where it's yeah. like half the time you're spending your time yelling at the, t at the TV or the movie screen being like, why? Why would you do why that? Would you why? Do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then horror games are just like, oh, if you're so smart, you do it. <laughs> right, exactly. And then you're like, why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that you get a, a richer experience uh, about uh, uh, third-person horror games or first-person horror games, like the difference between uh, Silent Hill or uh, Outlast? Um, it's 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 a little less about the exact perspective, third verse first, as much as I prefer sort of more psychological, sad story-based horror than like blow 'em up action horror. Yeah, I think that's like where in my head the dividing line is is like you know games like. Um, the middle Resident Evil games, like basically four yeah. through six, um, games like that uh, are a little less interesting to me than necessarily games like Amnesia, where you're sort of like, you have no weapons and you just have to run. Yeah. Or uh, like Outlast or... Yeah, Outlast, yeah. Like exactly. the, first, the first couple hours of uh, Resident Evil 7. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Which is uh, great in VR. Resident Evil 7 in PSVR was terrifying. Uh, you're a braver person than me. I'm not doing that because right, right. I cannot afford that uh, giant right. toaster to strap to my head and B, I don't want any of that <laughs> close enough to me. That's fair. I'm getting VR. I'm just sticking to like Beat Saber and VR chats. Like that's <laughs> first. both good. Both are good though. Uh, well, since we're still on the topic of horror games, uh. What what's your opinion on the uh, the past couple of years of the indie horror scene? Like going from well, Five Nights at Freddy's onwards. Uh, what's yeah. your opinion on the quality of those? There's some great ones. I mean, like I think you know, Five Nights at Freddy's is definitely a jump scare game, but it does its job really well at it, and it's and it's like fun when you're when you're engaged in it. I, I like I like a lot of the indie games because they're often very they're smaller experiences. You know, a lot of the AAA games. You know, they have to, you know, the companies are, they have to make a 20 hour experience and it has to be, you know, collectibles and fine stuff. A lot of horror, indie horror games are two, three hours and they scare the, am I allowed to swear? I don't know how this works. Yeah. I'll say crap. I'll say crap because, because it seemed like you were slightly uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> scare the crap out of you. And, you know, and you get in and get out. Like there's one indie horror experience I played that was basically just like six short moments when you're in like an abandoned house. And each moment lasts like a minute and a half as you're walking around the house trying to figure out what happened. And that's it. And it's so scary because it feels like it's not found footage, but it almost has that feeling of it of like, I'm seeing something I'm not supposed to, and I'm not quite sure what it is. Yeah. Sort of like what was used for uh, Blair Witch Project or Chronicle. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, yeah, moving on to things that aren't horror games, though, may or may not come back to a time permitting. Sure. Uh, so your bio says that you went to NYU. Did yeah. you always intend to be a television writer, or did you gradually figure that out as you went along? I gradually figured that out as I went along. Um, in high school, uh, I again, going back to the video game thing, I was like, I'm going to become a programmer. And I took programming classes, and I was bad at it. I was extraordinarily bad at programming. <laughs> Um, to the point where, uh, it was also like everyone also assumed that's what I'd do because that's what I looked like in high, in middle school and high school where they're like, oh, you, you can't computer program, are you sure? Um, but I couldn't, I could not. And so I was like, okay, I like writing. And in my mind, I thought I would maybe get into book publishing, like I'd be an editor or maybe in some distant dream world, I'd be like a novelist. Um, I always liked comedy. I just, you know, comedy always seemed like, um, a job someone else does, you know, like, professional basketball player if you were like do you want to be in the nba i'd be like yeah but doesn't someone else do that you know what i mean like it's just it was always out of reach and i got to college and luckily in new york you know new york is a city where if you want to try to perform something you actually can try it pretty reasonably and my junior year i was kind of you know i 
people had said I was funny and I'd considered it and I hit up an open mic. And from there I started to build a career that eventually led to TV writing. So I never thought it, I never, until I started doing comedy, I did not think I would become a TV writer. Hmm. All right. Um, who are your comedy influences now? Um, uh, I definitely, in general, things like The Onion and Click Hole are big comedy influences on me. Yeah. Uh, I also like, um, you know, I like some of the classics. I like, you know, George Carlin, uh, which feels cliche to say at this point. Um, I really like Todd Berry. I really like Maria Bamford. Uh, Sarah Silverman was definitely early on in terms of like joke writing, just set up punch. Sarah Silverman's great for, um, it's, it's hard to say, like, a lot of different people. Like, there's also, like, different influences. Like, I like comedy that's about very sad things. Um, part, I, I enjoy getting into sad topics. So, weirdly, even someone like Shirley Jackson, with the way that she handled sad topics through horror, was, you know, not an influence in terms of, like, one-to-one, -one, but sort of like, oh, I want to be able to take that technique to, to express something sad through my medium. Hmm. If you can like take a sad event or an incredibly awful event and then somehow find the one thing that can make people smile in it, yeah, it kind of you know, not makes it better, but whoever's doing the bad thing, it sort of takes away their power. Yeah, and it's emotionally engaging. You know, it's a, it's to me, it's more interesting to talk about the things that make us sad than like you know comedy where it's like I hate my wife or I hate my husband. Like to me, that's mm -hmm. too surface level. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, what Mel Brooks said about uh, why he, a lot, much of his comedy was making fun of Nazis, where right. he made the comedy about it not to, to make light of the event. He did it to take away their power. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So since you're writing for uh, Samantha B's show, do you have a process for current events joke writing? Uh, do you write uh, solo or with a partner or in a group or um, with them? Well, uh, when I when I was a regular staff writer, the way we do it is everyone we the head writer at the time Melinda Taub, who's amazing, she would create an outline, and it's usually like eight points of like you know, just a bullet point outline, and then three or four writers would split that up, and we'd all go out on our own, write our own piece of it, and then Melinda's job was to put it back together, and then as a group we would rewrite it together, we'd punch it up, you know, we'd fact check it with the researchers. Um, since, w since we've gone remote, Kristen Bartlett and I became head writers three weeks before the pandemic. So mm -hmm. that was great. Um, yeah. always, always good when your first month on the job, there's an international pandemic. Uh, <laughs> so what Kristen and I do now is we do the outlines, writers split it up, but because writing remote's a little harder, it's usually just us and another writer or two writers who are doing the script rewrite. So basically everyone breaks off, writes their own piece, and then as a team, we sort of combine them and make sure they're coherent, uh, they make sense, no one repeated a joke, no one repeated info, and then we make the show. So it's kind of like doing a divide and conquer yep. and then the exact opposite to make sure it actually works. Exactly, absolutely. And since you mentioned the pandemic, uh, how has it affected your ability to work over these past 10 years, as it feels like? <laughs> um, well, I, uh, I'm lucky in that I have nobody and I have nothing but work. So for me, it's not that bad because I live in an apartment with a lot of video games and a lot of time. Um, yes. But it's been okay. It's, uh, you know, what, what's weird is what makes it hard isn't me personally. It's that, you know, um, I have coworkers and I have friends who, who aren't handling it as well, whether they have kids and they're struggling with that or, you know, they're not as antisocial as I am. So the confinement is hard. Um, so, you know, sometimes like you have to help other people who might not be doing quite as well with it, try to like, you know, keep going. And that is difficult during a pandemic and people are losing their mind. Yeah, it's hard to get that connection back when yeah. your connection is entirely dependent on uh, your ISP. I mean, seriously though, yeah. So... Back to the topic of like uh, comedy writing as a whole, do you ever find yourself writing a joke that you just you just knew you can't get put on the air, but you needed to write it anyway? All the time. We, uh, Kristen and I, do something called Monday jokes, and what Monday jokes are are jokes that we know Sam is going to read on. Uh, she's going to read during the read through, and she will she will either laugh or hate them, but they're there to be cut. <laughs> 
like we definitely put in jokes that we just because they're dumb and we know they won't go but we like them we're like these will live in front of an audience of like 30 people and then we'll cut it <laughs> so the end goal of that one is just to get her to say guys i can't put this yep. in there yep exactly oh. yep uh, so actually how did you get the sam b gig in the first place um she actually recruited me. I, uh, I, I've been doing late night writing for a little while. I've written for uh, Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, which became The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon, and I was there for both of those. I wrote on The President Show on Comedy Central, Adam Ruins Everything, a bunch of award shows. And I, uh, I'm sort of slowing my role now because it takes a lot of energy, but I was writing a ton of political jokes on Twitter. And Sam followed me years ago before she hired me. And as the president show was ending, she heard that it was ending and she went to my agents and managers and was like, hey, would he be interested in interviewing for this job? And I did. And because I wasn't a psychopath, they hired me. <laughs> That's really most comedy show interviews. If you're getting to the interview, they just want to make sure you're not an asshole. Because <laughs> uh, I was going to say. How often do they get psychopaths? They they do. I, that's the thing, though, is like, especially in a creative field, you'll be like, oh, this person's super funny. Then you'll meet them and be like, nope. You know, uh, dudes who are very intense. There are some very intense dudes in comedy. Yeah. It's a bit difficult to get into the uh, comedy field without at least some degree of mental uh, unhealthiness. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, also, you received the uh, 2020 WGA Award for Writing for Comedy Variety Series. Uh, first, like, how does that feel, man? Uh, it was unexpected. Uh, our show is one of those shows that always feels like it's nominated but doesn't win, which is good. It's a cliche. Yeah. Like, I would love to win, uh, but being nominated is, is always great. And, you know, we were very proud of that special, but we were also up against good competition. So we were at that award show kind of like, oh, it's our category, but you know, whatever. And when they called our name, it was incredible. Uh, you know, that was, that's my first time ever winning sort of an award like that for television writing. It was, it was honestly, it wasn't like the best moment of my life in some deep, I'll remember it on my deathbed way, but it was definitely a cool ass moment. Uh, and, and second, I, I just have to ask uh, about the WGA, but for those listening on the Writers Guild. Mm -hmm. So, do you have to like murder a hobo in the dead of winter in order to get into the Writers Guild, or did I just hear the process wrong? Uh, you heard the process wrong. That was in the 80s. Um, <laughs> now, uh, you have to, uh, it's, it's different depending on which arm of the guild you're kind of in. Um, you know, it's different if you're TV writing versus, because the Guild also represents a lot of uh, newsrooms, you know, in terms of like uh, print publications, online publications. So we have slightly different uh, ways into the Guild itself. For TV writing, I believe, you, first of all, you have to be on a Guild show, um, you know, and most, most TV shows now are Guild because if it's not a Writer's Guild show, then, you know, other unions get weird. Once you have one union, that one thing that's not union, other unions get weird about it. So usually it's all union or not. Um, Is it anything like with the Screen Actors Guild, where it's like a catch-22 of you have to have a Screen Actors Guild membership in order to get into a SAG production, but you can't get into that, or you can't get anything into the, into the Screen Actors Guild without being on a SAG production? It's a lot easier than that. Um, now oh, you have good. to like, it's, it's almost like the Writers Guild, you're allowed to work on a Writers Guild show, but once you earn a certain amount, they sort of force you to join. And I think that amount, that amount goes up a little bit each year. I think the amount now is like 38,000 or 40,000 in, in a full year. So it doesn't have to be like, um, but it has to be from a WGA sanction. This is just TV. I don't know what newsrooms are and I assume they're different, but um, for TV, and I also don't know what film is. Film might be the same rule money-wise, but I really don't know. Um, for TV, you need to earn something like 38, 40,000. And then there is an entry fee of like, I think it's like 2,000 for the East and 4,000 for WJ West, but I could be very wrong about that. I know that West and East have slightly different uh, entry fees. Um, okay, like on 38K a year, uh, that's... That's pretty intense, though. So, like with the with the actual rates, I guess it's kind of a low bar. Like, it is. Do you it's, ever have yeah. problems with it, or? 
No, but like, you know, it's very possible to like, if you're out of work for a while or you're only did, you only did like a six week show or something that the math isn't there for that. It's not a super hard bar to reach, but it is a, a relatively hard bar. On the bright side, once you're like, once you qualify and you have to qualify every year with that amount, if you don't qualify, they sort of, you're still a member, but you're sort of like, I forget the term, but you're not like a full on member. But as long mm -hmm. as you qualify for that 40 every year, you have health insurance. Um, if you're in there a couple of years, you start to get a pension. Um, so they do take care of you. Like if I lost my job right now, I would have health insurance until 2021. Damn. Yeah. I gotta get me some of that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, now, on the flip side of the earlier question about uh, like uh, writing a joke, but you know it can't get on the air. Did you ever write a joke that made it to air, but you immediately regretted having it made to air? Um, no, I mean, there's definitely jokes I've written that I didn't necessarily, I was like, I could have done better, but we were out of time, you know, where something's like kind of corny or what have you. I think the the closest example example I can think of is uh, Kristen, who again is the head writer now with me. Um, she called uh, Ivanka Trump the c word, and we almost got canceled. So I think that was regrettable, but um, it wasn't my joke. And every time someone asks me if it was my joke, I'm like, you you assume it was my joke. That feels weird, um, but it was not my joke. Okay then. Uh... Uh, Bridget, take note, uh, we're not allowed to call anyone the C word. If You're not allowed to do that. Well. Apparently people get very mad, we found out, in 2018. Um, uh, on TV. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now on YouTube we can't say uh, you can't even say anything. No. Yeah, YouTube no. gets a bit testy about uh, if you say the word the, apparently. You're just going to have to keep saying it to people's face. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when it's uh, true. <laughs> oh, well. So... In non-plague times, uh, in the before four times, uh, since you work on a uh, current events-based uh, writing staff, uh, what do you do to unwind after having to pay attention to all the awful all day long? Um, I mean, you know, there's a couple things. Uh, there is always weed, which helps. <laughs> uh, I, I would love to lie and say something better than that. Um, I've been trying, you know, different relaxation things. I also try... You know, I've been doing meditating, which always feels like cheesy to do, but also helps. So I always have that catch-22 in my head. Uh, so I've been meditating. I, you know, I read a lot. I play it. I mean, obviously, as I've mentioned, I play a ton of video games. I work on other projects. Um, but in all honesty, it's, it's hard. It's hard to turn it off because, you know, I'm still working remote. And it's, it definitely at times feels like it's not like I'm working at home, but living at work. And so at times it's like very hard to be like, okay, I'm going to relax. Oh, a message just came in, especially now that I'm head writer on the show, there'll be a message at like 11 PM where I'm like, I have to drop everything and go do it. So it's been kind of hard to escape the stress. Well, at the very least, uh, I, your weed's legal in New York. So there's that. It's, it's still not, it's still not yet, Wait, it's but not it's, it's a lot, it's a lot easier than I'm sure Texas is. I'm sure Texas is a real rough gambit. Uh, New York, it's more like, they're like, try not to. <laughs> <laughs> it was like okay we're, we're not gonna entirely get on the air and lock it down about it just just don't yeah. please just, it's very like it's very like just don't let us see it that's it <laughs> we're not gonna fight you on it um at least now it is it used to be real bad just um, like not in public please <laughs> it basically yeah state. yeah it's like college dorm rules where it's like if no one complains it's fine you know, well, in Texas, you can't smell like pat patchouli without some somebody somewhere being like, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. That's illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, so since we got a bit more time, uh, in terms of video games, what are you playing right now? I am playing Dragon Quest XI on the Switch, oh. and it is a delightful game. I somehow got, I got an Xbox Series X and a PlayStation 5, and I have spent the vast majority of time on my Switch in the past month. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, also a, in that case, uh, it, with with that kind of salary, can can you get me in touch with Samantha B? I feel like I need this extra cash. In <laughs> no, no, that's that's the thing is, if you, I have friends who make what I make, but they have a family, and that's a mistake. When you have nothing, you can get anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, what what's the most recent horror game you played? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously, for the Silent Hill book, I played through that a ton of times. Um, I, you know what? I played um, Silent Hill Shattered Memories recently, which is this spin-off game that came out for the Wii, PS2, and PSP, which is like, it was made by, uh, I forget if it was an American team or a British team, but it was made by a Western team. And it's a very different type of Silent Hill game, but it's one of my favorites in the series because it tries so many new things. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you play any uh, RPGs or tabletop games? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I have, yeah. I have, like, I was going to grab some, but I have, like, a ton of role-playing books on different shelves around here. Um, I, I love I love tabletop RPGs. Um, I was in a couple remote games for a while that wrapped up, but, no, I, you know, I'm, like, I'm playing Dragon Quest, which is an RPG, obviously, but um, the last game I played, I played, um, I actually played a ta tabletop cyberpunk. Um, oh! Yeah. Nice. My friend ran a game, like, right before the video game came out. I think in conjunction with them, Hmm. But it was like a three episode thing where they gave it gave away the book. Yeah, well, luckily the uh, theater of the mind doesn't have as many glitches. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, I know, man. I, 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 I forgot I pre-ordered that game. So when it showed up in my Xbox, I was like, Oh yeah, you did that. Um, <laughs> what a weird game. What a weird game. Yeah, like, at this point, I, I still, honestly, I have no idea what the game's about. All I know is that it was hype for a long time, and it was super buggy, and everybody was angry because, like, the situation where it's like, oh, why do you keep delaying it? Just release it. And then they're like, okay. They're like, why'd yeah. you release it so soon? It's all buggy. You should have delayed it. Uh, I mean, like, you, honestly, you know, after, like, it, it feels like it's a Bethesda game. And both because of the bugs, but also in terms of like playing it, it feels like Skyrim or Fallout, you know, three and up because you're basically like, it's almost the exact same type of game. So weirdly, it feels less like Witcher 3 than it does like Fallout 3. Ooh. Yeah, hmm is right. <laughs> I said something interesting. Yeah, this is a, this is a, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am useless as a human being. Nah, nah. At the very least, you make people happy. That's true. I do. So, well, what's the most disappointing game that you like? You saw, you wanted it really bad. You're like, ah, this is this is gonna be the best experience ever. And then when you played it, it was absolute garbage. Uh, well, I was married for one year, but that's, <laughs> um, uh, so that wasn't great in terms of like things that like you know I didn't finish, but um, uh. I'm trying to think. Usually uh, when I'm disappointed by a game, I'm just sort of like, it's my fault. I tend to blame myself. Um, I, I can't think of an honest example where I blame the game. Like, like, okay, for example, Red Dead Redemption 2, I know is a good game. I respect why people love it, but about five or six hours into it, I was like, I don't like this. And I know <laughs> it's because of me. So usually if I don't like a game, I know that it has some sort of quality behind it, but I have failed the game, not the other way around. So wait, 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 wait. self-hating for wanting better. Are are you Jewish? It no, it just my dad's Jewish though, but um, my mom's Catholic, so I got the whole thing. Are you sure you're not Jewish? I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. But I, I was, was also raised in South Florida, so a lot of Jewish around me. Uh oh, and again, uh, Jewish right. family. So uh, to quote the birdcage, you know, where there's sand. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, just to wrap all this up. Uh, there's one question that we've been asking all the guests we've had this season. If you had a magic wand or a monkey's paw or some other magic item that would allow you to change two things about the world, what would you change? Um, I would definitely probably take away the coronavirus. I think that doing something else would have been ter terrible. Um, <laughs> uh, so definitely coronavirus. And then what else would I change with the last wish? <sighs> That's a tough question, because a lot of people need help in this world. Um, and I do miss the store Toys R Us. So I would probably wow. reopen the store Toys R Us. <laughs> <laughs> like, world hunger is bad, but there's also no Toys R Us anymore. Yeah, it's like, wh where else are we supposed to see all sorts of empty shelf space? Yeah, yeah, where are you going to see uh, 30 copies of Connect 4? <laughs> oh. <laughs> or them still trying to sell the last uh, Wii's they had alongside uh, the yeah. last Connect. It's a great time. <laughs> uh, or like, like, like not just for Toys R Us, but then like for other places that phase them out, 
those demo stations. Oh, I miss yeah. those. The little like dog that would bark and then like hop a little bit. Yeah. Yep. The dancing plant. Yeah. No. No. Well, that, no. that one. <laughs> nah. <laughs> but no. Well, I got it. Okay. Uh, so I know if uh, if nobody knew, is there anything selfish that you'd wish for yourself? Um, um, the Us? Honestly, I. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, 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 weirdly, as, as self-deprecating as I am, I have a pretty good life, and I feel like I don't need the wish. I mean, I guess I would wish that I can keep working, like, after, whenever this job ends, I will get another job, but in terms of my life right now, I think I'm lucky enough where I, I wouldn't waste a wish on me. Self-deprecation, guilt, and, uh, and fairly contented. Are, listen, are you sure you're not Jewish? I'm I'm sure. I'm sure it's confirmed in everything. <laughs> confirmed in, in, in the universal Catholic Church. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay, that's a bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not religious anymore, but that's what happened. Catholicism <laughs> will do that to you. <laughs> Catholicism in 2020 will definitely do that to you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> just like, why, God, why? And then the only response being, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think that's probably a good place to wrap it up. Uh, Mike Trucker, everybody. We'll be right back. Oh, hey, thank you very much for watching. We'd like to thank Mike Trucker for taking time out of his busy schedule to come on our Rinky Dink Little Show. If you enjoyed what you saw, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, it is what it is.